Okay, so we're going to talk about vectors in this chapter, right? Um, until now, whatever quantity we've found have just been that, just quantities with values, numerical values, right? 34 square meters, um, 54 miles, 38 miles per hour, and so on. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, a vector, however, has a little bit more information than that, okay? A vector is a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction, all right? So an example would be velocity, force, okay? Lots and lots of um, vector quantities on, uh, out there. And when you start taking physics... Um, you, you really see that there is a huge difference between a vector and a simply, you know, and, and a quantity that is not a vector. A quantity which has only a magnitude and no direction is called a scalar, right? Um, so, for example, when I say um, I'm going, let's say, 75 miles an hour, that's a scalar quantity. That's my speed, 75 miles an hour. That's my speed, that's scalar. Velocity will say, I'm going 75 miles an hour north. That would be my velocity, okay? Um, so that's the difference between velocity and speed. Yes, they both tell you how fast you're going, but velocity also tells you how fast you're going and in what direction you're going, okay? You just need a direction. Time is a scalar quantity, so no. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to do No. I mean, yes and no. That's a unit vector. We're going to talk about it. But it, it's, you know, yeah. Yes and no, yeah. All right, so talk about this one. The first one. A ball thrown northwest at 60 meters per second. What do you think, vector or scalar? Yeah. Right. And the second? Yeah. Scalar. And the next one? Right. Okay. So, so the way vectors are, this lesson is mostly about just the new vocabulary, the new terminology, okay? Um, so we're going to get used to like new notation and all that good stuff. Vectors then, because they have a specified direction, they're represented as an arrow diagram, or you can call it a directed line segment. So take a look at the vector here, right? It has a clear direction, like there is no question about the direction of this. So it has an initial point and a terminal point, right? It looks like a ray, but we don't call it a ray, it's a vector. Um, the initial point, right, that where it's, we call that the initial point or the tail, um, and then B is where it um, terminates, we call it the terminal point or the head or the tail, depending on like, different books call it different things. Now, how do we, what is the notation for vectors? The initial and end points are going to be given capital letters, so if you want to name the vector, then it'll be capital AB with an arrow, but look at how the arrow looks. It's a it's a half arrow. Okay, not so it's not like the notation for the right. Or you could give it a lowercase name and just call it vector A, vector P, vector Q, whatever you would you would like. And that would be A like this. In books, to simplify the notation, if they're talking about a vector, they would simply write it as like bold lowercase a, okay? Now, a vector in standard position is one where the initial point is at the origin, just like we had in trig or um, geometry. Okay, and how do we specify the direction? The direction is specified using an angle. So um, this is, take a look at the horizontal line, right? 
you draw a horizontal line. There has to be a horizontal line for reference drawn at the initial point of the vector, right? And then we go counterclockwise from that, and the angle in which you know which you go counterclockwise will specify the direction. All right, so that's thirty-five degrees. So the direction is the angle between the vector and a horizontal line. So if I had a vector, you know, like this out in space somewhere, I would draw a horizontal line at the initial point, and then that angle would be the direction of it. The magnitude of the vector is simply the line, the length of the line segment. Okay? So you take a ruler, you measure the segment from A to B, however long it is, that would um, like symbolize the magnitude of the vector. So if the velocity is like 35 miles an hour versus 50 miles an hour, you would have a longer or shorter segment. Now, if we're talking about like a 580 mile per hour vector, right? We're not going to draw 580 centimeters or inches of anything. That's just silly. So just like a map, we scale things down, okay? So this in this vector above, right, we've, we're, we've been told that each centimeter is 5 feet per second. So how would you figure out what that vector represents? You take your ruler, you measure this. I took my ruler, I measured it, it was 2 point how many? It was 2.6 centimeters. 2.6 times 5, this represents a velocity of 13 feet per second. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? Now, notation for magnitude is this. Right? It's the absolute value. It's the vertical bars. Right? So if I say this... 13 feet per second okay now a few uh, one more thing if you're talking about magnitude if you're specifying magnitude you don't give direction that's just the, the number value okay all right now 99% of the time when you deal with vectors you're gonna measure it this way you're gonna measure direction this way horizontal line at the initial point, blah, blah, blah. There are some areas, some fields, which have their own ways of measuring angle. We call that bearing. And it's used mostly in like in aeronautics, like in, in flight, or um, like when it comes to like ships, right? Like when they're at sea, when they're giving directions at sea. So those guys, because they're a little weird, they measure it using bearing, and the way bearing is measured is there are two types of bearing. We're going to talk about quadrant bearing and true bearing, all right? So take a look at what is, go, what is quadrant bearing? Quadrant bearing um, is a measurement between 0 and 90 degrees, <clears throat> and it's measured from the north-south line. Okay, so look, here's my angle. So this is the only time in life when you measure an angle starting from a vertical line. Never in trig, never in the other vector measurement that I showed you, just when you're talking about bearing. All right, here is my angle. I need to measure it from the north-south vertical line. All right, if I measure it from the top, I get 145 degrees. That's no good because I need a number between 0 and 90, okay? So if this angle is 145 degrees, and that's unusable to me, then I'm going to use this one. How much is that one out of 180? 35. So that angle is 35 degrees, and they give it the symbol phi. It's no big deal. So that's 35 degrees. 35 degrees where? We measure this. It's 35 degrees from the south direction. Which way? East. So it's 35 degrees east of south, right, or that. 
35 degrees east of south. You know you've seen it. You, you've probably seen it in movies, like where you're talking about like the location of a ship or when they talk about a radar, right? Next time, like pay attention. True bearing, it's a little bit more simplified. True bearing always goes from the north line, okay? And um, it's always measured clockwise from north. And it's always given three digits. So if a direction measures 25 degrees clockwise from north, so take a look. If this is my angle, right, if that's vector V and it measures 25 degrees, then you just say it's 025 degrees. Okay? So how would this measure then? Ah, sorry. What would that be if this is if this is vector V and suppose this is 120 degrees, you just say 120 degrees. All right? Okay. We are going to concentrate more on this stuff. Okay. Now, more terminology with vectors. You can have parallel vectors, equivalent vectors, opposite vectors, all that good stuff. Parallel vectors run... So they can be in either the same or opposite direction, but not necessarily the same magnitude. So what are some parallel vectors in that... Um, uh, group of vectors up there. A and B are parallel. A and B and then C is parallel to them and E is parallel to them and F, right. Okay? Equivalent vectors have the same magnitude and the same direction. So, which would, you, would appear to be equivalent here? A and C. Okay, so we could say A is equal to C. Um, opposite vectors have the same magnitude but opposite direction. So vector E, we say, is the negative of vector A. Okay? All right, here's an important piece of information. Here, the negative is for direction. Right? So if I have a vector A... And if I want it to draw negative A, it would be the same exact size, but going in the opposite direction. Okay? All right. Now, we said earlier that vectors could represent forces, right? Is it possible that at any given time, there could be more than one force acting on an object? There is. Okay? So, tug of war. Perfect example. If one group is pulling to the left, another group is pulling to the right, which way is it gonna go? The one that's stronger. So it's gonna be so it's gonna move in the direction where the net force points, right? So if somebody's pulling at like five newtons to the left, twelve newtons to the right, there is a balance of seven newtons to the right, so it's gonna go to the right. Okay? So how did we do that? We sort of took the sum of all of those vectors. Are those the tissues? We have to look at, we have to sum up our vectors, right? To do that, believe it or not, there is a method. There are two methods, actually. Um, in numbers, when we add them, what we get is our sum. When we add two vectors, what we get is a resultant, okay? There are two methods, like I said, the triangle and the parallelogram method. I have to admit I'm partial to the triangle method, okay, just because. All right, here's how we add vectors. You take, you have two vectors, right? Each of these vectors has a beginning and an end, right? So this vector A has a beginning and an end, right? What you do is you take your second vector and you put it at the end of the first vector, okay? So you put the beginning of the second at the end of the first. So, we, you know, they talk about like um, 
the tail of the second at the head of the first. I know it gets confusing. The way I tell my students is this. Suppose these two vectors represent the, um, the path that somebody took to go to the store. So he starts from his home and then he's gonna go to the store. And somebody like took his route and like cut it up. And now we just have to put it back together. So he walked in the direction of A for a little bit and then a little bit in the direction of B, right? So this, the A is the first part of his route. B is the continuation of the route. So what you do is you, you line them up in order of him walking, right? So from beginning to end. So he started from his house and he went to the store. That's the store, right? At the end of the day, if you take a bird's eye view, where was he at the very beginning and where was he at the very end? Without all the mess in between, he went from here to there. So that green one is the sum of the vectors or the resultant of the vectors. All right? Okay. So let's do that with V and W. Normally what you would have to do, like what we would have to do is like take a ruler and a protractor and do it like precisely. I'm not going to make you do that because with these online books it's a little difficult to do. We're going to do it like mathematically. But what we would do is, look, we take this vector V, right? I'm, I'm going to reproduce it exactly here or as best as I can. And then we take this vector W, put it here. The resultant is the beginning of the story to the very end of the story there. So that green is the resultant vector. It's V plus W. Yes? Cool. Okay. Take a look at this next one. Huh? That guy got nowhere. Okay? Because look, first... He walked from his house that way, <coughs> and then he walked the same direction, the same distance, back in the opposite direction. He forgot his car. He forgot his car. Where was he in the beginning? Here. Where is he in the end? Here. He got nowhere. So this is zero, right? So, so a plus negative a is zero then, and that that could happen. Okay, because if this tug of war, you have two perfectly well matched teams and they're pulling in opposite directions with the exact same force, where is the rope going to go? Nowhere, because they cancel each other out. Okay, that's a thing, it happens. Okay. We're not getting the numerical answer, we're just looking at how this result of business would look. All right, talking about scalars, right? If I multiplied a vector A by a number, let's say, oh, three, all I do is multiply the size of the vector by three. So here is vector A, right? 3A is the vector just three times as long. Does it change the direction? Oh, no. All right, so take a look at this now. What if we wanted to do 3x minus 3 quarters y? Yeah. 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 There's no dot. There's never a dot. Like on the first yeah, there's not going to be a dot. Okay. So um, 3x is going to be 3 times the size of x, but in the same direction, right? So let's estimate, that's going to be 1, 2, 3 times as big. That's 3x. How does negative 3 quarters y look? So the 3 quarters, I get it, right? It's, it's like, it's 3 quarters the length, but you flip the direction, correct. So this then is negative 3 quarters y, right? So how would the result look from where to where? Right, from the very beginning to the very end. Whoops. Arrows are key. If you don't put the arrows correctly, then sorry, but it's a completely different situation. Right? It's like a 
it's like a rocket going in the totally like wrong direction, right? And that makes all the difference. You also have to be careful, um, you know, later on. Like I, I see all sorts of crazy things, like planes changing their direction and they go at like 90 degrees, which means like the plane is going directly up. That's not cool. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Let's look at that green vector, the resultant, right? Where did that come from? That was the combination of the red and the blue, right? Now, suppose what we have here is some lost resultant vector. And you're tasked with finding the two vectors which combined to give you this, okay? So draw something like this, just a random vector like this. And now draw two components, like two um, vectors that would potentially add up to give you this. And yes, there can be different answers. So go at it. Half a second. Um, half a like this, okay? Look, I could have drawn two completely different vectors. I could have drawn two vectors that look like this. Watch. Those still add up to that. And this one, right? Those also add up to that. So you, in each case, each pair of vectors that sum and result in the green vector are called the components of the vector. All right? Now, somebody else may have drawn their vectors like this. One horizontal, oh my, and one vertical. Okay? We could have done that too, right? What's to stop us? Huh? No. Mm, th we're not we're not doing this no we're not doing this we're doing this we're not doing this yet okay it's fine so this is the most conventional because when you do this then you could put it on a coordinate plane with an x-axis and a y-axis all right we call those rectangular components so the vectors which add to create a vector R are called the components of R. It's most useful to have rectangular components, horizontal and vertical. And, you know, you hear about this all the time. Let's resolve the vector into its rectangular components. And that's how we do it. So, take a look at this guy, Will. He's working in his garden. And he pushes a shovel into the ground. Here's the ground. With a force of 630 newtons at an angle of 70 degrees with the ground. So here's his shovel. Um, draw a diagram that shows the resolution of the force that will, that will exert into its rectangular, rectangular components. So the force is being projected along that shovel from will to the ground. We need, a vec we need an arrow because this is a vector and that's how the arrow looks. Now, we have to label this. This has a magnitude of 630 newtons and it's got an angle of 70 degrees. To resolve it into its rectangular components, we draw a vertical and a horizontal component. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to put A and B all the time, but I'm going to put it this one time. This is the direction of this vector from A to B. Here's how your arrows are going to go. There is no question for how the purple arrow is going to have its arrow, right? It's just going down into the ground. Now, in order to go from A to B, you could take two routes. One is just the purple, 
or you could follow the red and the blue, right? To do that, there can only be one direction to go from A to B. You have to go down and you have to go to the left. That means your arrows must be pointing down and to the left. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. In this situation. Will is pushing, yes, Will is pushing the shovel down. Now, if it was talking about, if it was talking about, you know, something else that's being shot upwards, then how will the arrows look? You have to go to the right and up, right? So the point is, you have to go from A to B. And if you trace the arrows, it has to get you from A to B. You, you, you can't go to somewhere else, okay? So this now, we label this as X, and we label this as Y. If you want full credit on a question that looks like this, this is exactly how it needs to look. The only thing you can omit is A and B. So here we go. I need the arrows, I need the X, I need the Y, I need the magnitude and the direction. Uh huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it has to look like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now it says find the magnitudes of the horizontal and the comp and the vertical components of the force. So now I need to find the magnitude of the horizontal. That's well, that's um, x with a bar. So let's take a look here. What kind of triangle have I just come up with? A right triangle, and I've got an angle. What is it? I see a cosine in the future. So, cosine of 70 is equal to x magnitude times what? Uh, over what? 630. So, x is 630 cosine of 70, and I need some help from my friends here. How much is this? You're sure? Okay. So X is 215.47 newtons. That's the magnitude of X. All right, what about Y then? What do you think? Sine of 70 is Y over 630. So Y is equal to what? 630 sine of 70, 592, no decimals. What is your, okay, if you want to be, okay, so here we go. Now, take a look. Take a look. Um, okay. Back when we were doing the unit circle. This is how our angles looked, right? And if I wanted to find, if this angle was not 70, but 30, and if I wanted to find the sine of 30, where would I look? To the vertical or the horizontal? The vertical, right? And look, the vertical is always my sine. So what is it, in fact? It's the magnitude times the sine of this angle. And if I wanted to find the cosine of that angle, would I look to the vertical or the horizontal? The horizontal and in fact my horizontal component is always going to be the magnitude times the what of the angle cosine of the angle so now if you wanted to find X and you wanted to skip that first step and go to that one fabulous okay eventually you'll get there yes well X squared plus Y squared would equal the square root, uh, 630 squared, right? Okay, here we go. Who are my soccer players? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because there's never, there's never going to be a special angle. Because how often do you kick a soccer ball at exactly 30, 60, or 45 degrees? Not very. Um, 
So, a player kicks a soccer ball so that it leaves the ground with an S with a velocity of 44 feet per second at an angle of 33 degrees with the ground. Draw a diagram, blah, blah, blah. So, all right, so I'm going to give you five minutes to do A and B here. Go. I'll stop this for five minutes. <laughs> so, I, so, I rounded to 37 and 24, you know, so it's about 37 and it's about 24 feet per second. And um, it'll specify on your test or quiz to what direction, you, uh, to what um, decimals you're going to go to. So, you would exert more energy on the system. Say it. more energy going like this way, not in this that way, because that's like 37 feet per second and 23 feet per second, but like the middle one is going to be yeah. Okay, so, shh, look, so the player kicks the ball at an angle of 33 degrees, and he gives it an initial velocity of 44 feet per second. Because it's at an angle, because that has um, a horizontal and a vertical component, at the end of the day, where will the ball end up? A little bit to the right and a little bit up from where it started. Now, because of the angle, the angle is 33 degrees. The horizontal side, right, is a little bit longer. So the horizontal magnitude is a little bit longer. So it'll go further to the right than it will upward. If his angle had been higher than 45, right, if his angle had been higher than 45, like 70 degrees, then, it'll go, then it will have gone up more than to the right. Okay? Okay, but I have a question. So what if the player just like kicked it um, on the ground or whatever, there's like, however many... I'm just going to set this one up and then there is another one that I want to do. An airplane is flying 40 degrees northeast with an airspeed of 310 knots. So 40 degrees north of east. So here we go. Um, 40 degrees. It encounters a 78 knot tailwind acting in the direction 145 north of east. Okay? So, this one, 145 degrees north of east. So, if this is the east direction, 145 degrees will be about there. Right? That way? Okay, now, how big should that one be? If this is 310 knots, if we wanted to do it like proportionally, right? How big is that? That's like 78 out of 310. It's about how much? It's about a quarter. It's about a quarter, right? So that should technically have like a quarter of the size as this, right? So one, two, three, four. So like very tiny. Right? So that's 78 knots. I missed the end. It's okay. Right? And that, that's like 145 degrees there. So what's the result then? There. Okay, so what we can do here is call this vector P, right, because that's the plane, call this vector W, and then the other one will be P plus W. So what happens here? The plane was flying in that direction, now there is wind. The airplane now acquires new ground speed and direction. What are they? So take a look, the wind is actually like changing the direction of the plane, right? And what would you suspect 
the new speed of the plane to be? Higher than 310 or lower? Lower, right? So the magnitude of P plus W is going to be lower than 310 knots. This is why when you're in a plane and if you're flying with the wind or against or against the wind, right? If you're going in one direction, like the flight might take four hours, but in the other direction, it might take three and a half hours, right? This is the reason why. Now, in the next few um, sections, we're going to talk about exactly, like, precisely how to figure that out, okay? The new direction. All right. So let's take a look at this. Carla and Oscar are pulling a wagon full of plants. Each person pulls the wagon with equal force at an angle of 30 degrees with the x-axis or with the axis of the wagon. The resultant is 120 newtons. So how many vectors do we have that are adding up to 120? Two. How much force is each person exerting? So this is probably the the one thing that you just have to learn how to do is how to go from an actual f diagram of how things look in real life to a math slash physics diagram, all right? We have the two forces here, but look, they're, they're originating from the same point because in reality, they are being applied to the same. But in math, if I want to add those two vectors and get a resultant, is this a good way of drawing it? No. So I want to get the first force, okay? This is Carla's force. And where would I put Oscar's force vector? Where? At the end of this one, right? Because they're being added to each other. And it's going to be the same magnitude, but in that direction, right? Do you see how I did this? If I were able to, like if these arrows were movable, if I were to grab that arrow and just move it up and put it here. This is why I love teaching with my, at the old school we had smart boards and I could do that. I could actually like move the arrow. I mean, I guess I could do it on, the, on there too. But if I were to take this arrow, and just put it as a continuation of this, I would get something like what I drew, right? So that's another F. And now my resultant would look like what? What kind of a line would it look like? That's a horizontal line here. Okay. And I know that this is 30 degrees. How much is this angle? 30 degrees. And we know that from, gosh, a whole bunch of different things. We know it first because what kind of a triangle have I just drawn? It's yes, an isosceles triangle. And what's the isosceles triangle base theorem, uh, base angles theorem? Right. Also, take a look here at this force, right? This is 30 degrees. What if, okay, so that angle here is that angle there, right? This angle here. What kind of angles are these? Alternate interior angles, right? So it's also 30 degrees, okay? Now, so that's 30 degrees, and this is 120 newtons. Now, can I find F? Yeah, 30. Huh? 30. Oh my gosh, it's so geometry. This is 60 degrees. Uh, I'm sorry, this is 120 degrees. Right, if you draw a line. What did you say? Apothem. Okay, all right. Let's, okay, so... um. This is 30 degrees, so what do we have up here? 60 degrees, and 60, 30, 60, 90. And if I just draw one of those, this is 60 newtons here. So how much is F? Oh, 
Well, it can't be 120 because these two forces have to add up to 120. So this this one is 60 over root 3. Is that right? Right? The short leg is the long divided by root 3. And then F would be... Right, so F would be 120 over root 3. But we would have to put it in terms of decimals. Okay? So the next question then is, if each person exerts a force of 75 newtons, what is the resultant force? So I want you guys to do that one independently now. 